Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Wall is the name standing before you. Max Wall, in the flesh, not a cartoon. <laughs> The name Wall, Commodore Garden. You've heard of the Great Wall of China? He was my grandfather. <laughs> he was a brick. There was a huge brick wall locally where it said Mill Wall. And underneath somebody had written Brick Wall. And underneath that somebody wrote Max Wall. And he was absolutely chuffed a bit the idea <laughs> that he'd got his very own piece of graffiti. I'm dying to be what I'm not. I'd give everything that I've got. <coughs> To write plays like Coward or act like Coward I'm longing for gold winter say Whatever you ask me, I'll pay To make pictures for me, but hear my story I was born on a dancing mat I can play a guitar But I'll have to do more than that Or they never will make me a star He was unique. There was nobody quite like him. Nobody who kind of combined all the skills that this man had. Splendid! I liked him immensely. I really did. Capital. I was in a panto with the great Max Wall. I didn't know he was great Max Wall at all. When you're 12, you just think everybody's very good, but you don't think they're great. He was just so funny. I salute you, my dear. I saw him on the television when I was at school doing my A-levels. That's right. Now... I can remember beating the floor with... and not being able to get breath with the laughter that was coming out. I'd never seen anything so funny in my life. Imitation, a cocker spaniel. <laughs> this is how weird it was, Max. He stood there in the next stall to me and he looked down, looked up at the porcelain and said, You, you little devil, you're the cause of all the trouble. And that's true, it was. And walked out. I never even met him, never didn't say hello. He was talking to his willy. <laughs> oh, naughty. I think he's how a jester would have actually been, quite dark, actually. There was something quite dark about him, you know, the way he looked and the, and the tights and the... You know, you're you just that far away from the, the big, long shoes with the points, you know, like little rump of stiltskin. I don't wish the ladies in my audience tonight to get the wrong impression of me. <laughs> Is that clearly understood? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't wish them to get the wrong impression. <laughs> here, here. You have not the wrong impression of you. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't frightened, were you? <laughs> I don't frighten people anymore since I had the nut and bolt taken out of his neck. <laughs> I admired him from the very beginning. Comedy just emanated from him. It was very hard to describe it. I remember I wrote one joke for him. Uh, he would come out on stage and I would say, You look glum, Max. What happened? You get out of bed the wrong side this morning? And Max would say, What did you expect me to do? Jump over my father and mother? At the age of six, I lost both my parents. <laughs> what a card game that was. <laughs> Your father, he was a famous Scottish comedian, wasn't he? Yes, he was, yes. Jock Lorimer, the Chinese Scotsman, he used to put a, a Chinese wig on with a pigtail down the back and sing. ching a ling a ling ching ching a ling a ling hoo hai hoo hai <laughs> It's a broad brech moon nech nech te nech coming through the rye. <laughs> Oh, I'm half Scotch and half Chinese, as sure as eggs are eggs. And I didn't care a damn if my old pigtail keeps on tickling my legs. <laughs> he was born into the music halls and, and saw it all at a very early age. And he absorbed it all. He could remember acts going really right back to the 20s. This business, treading the boards, I was born in it. Born, I ri literally was, believe me. Not in a trunk. Nothing like that. Rivers, Judy Garland, gorgeous one, she was, she was little, or well, young. Born in a trunk at the Victoria Theatre. Yeah. I 
I loved all that Yankee brashness. People! Nobody's born in the trunk. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I was born at home quite normally. Yes. It wasn't until after they saw me they put me in a trunk. I'm a lucky cow to have someone to put my arms around. That's why I'm shouting so the world will know. Here I go. I'm Alabama bound. What was amazing about him was to see something which had links back. I mean, I know he became terribly popular as a sort of grotesque and eccentric comedian, but what you also saw was a sort of um, a sort of link back to um, uh, I don't know, probably a little titch. <laughs> Nijinsky would say, I want to see my favourite dancer, and it was Little Titch. And Nijinsky would go all over England to find Little Titch. And Little Titch is the same era as Max. Max had the big shoes. Little Titches were even bigger. And Little Titch could stand and lean straight forward and pick up his hat on his head and come straight back up and then roll up onto the toes. But again, he had a special body. He was only four foot six tall. And Max Wall didn't have that, but he had his own special rubbery kind of body, which made him unique and able to dance in those ways. What's appealing about the way Max dances is the musicality. I mean, he's only dancing often to a beat, yum bum bum, ba dum bum bum, ba -dum. but he's really syncopating it, picking out the rhythm, playing with the rhythm. That's what's so instantly appealing about it. What I also very much enjoy about him are the the early examples of styles of dancing which we consider normal now. I mean, Michael Jackson's moonwalk is there. There's a lot of break dancing, there's body popping, there's all sorts of things coming in. His father was an eccentric dancer and he started as a straight dancer and then before he knew it he was doing eccentric dancing and then he put the gags in. For me, it was... A similar sort of thing when I was at school, you know, there was the body popping was the craze, you know, and the robotics was the craze. And I think that's what happens. I think you use everything, what I personally do, I use everything I, I've, I know and have had and put it onto a stage environment. And I, I think, you know, with, you know, the body popping is now quite comical. I thought you'd done very well, Terry. What really surprised me was his flexibility, which is extraordinary. I mean, e even in his later years, you know, the leg goes up, you know, there it goes, and... You, you really don't expect somebody of, of that age, looking so normal, to suddenly have their legs up around their ears. Oh, yes. I've never neglected the bar work. I think a good early training stands you in good stead for a long time, but the genetics must have been good. I mean, it's very low body fat. It, it's, it's very well proportioned. He just had a lot going for him. Now, small novelty, haircut with a hole in the centre. <laughs> the hair just never grew there, because he told me, as a child, uh... He'd practice every day falling backwards onto concrete so that he could take anything, uh, his body could take anything. I mean, he'd pull those awful, ugly faces, he made those shapes, he attacked them, and he was daring them to actually not like him. He took it to the edge, and then he'd say, this, he'd pull this grotesque face and stick his back out and do this silly walk, and go up them like a gorilla, and you could see them shrinking back, and then he'd say, and that's enough of that. And all of a sudden, the spell was broken, and back he was, this benign comic. It was extraordinary to watch him work like that. He was somewhere on the evolutionary scale, but I don't know where. It certainly wasn't human. And uh, that, of course, is what clowns have always been. I mean, it's the, the position of the fool is to be the deformed one who has taken on himself the curse of mankind and therefore is good luck, you know, because he's accrued all the ill fortune to himself. 
Oh, follow, follow, follow. The many, many types of fan. The hop of meat, the hop of beast, the hop of meat, man. Oh, where'd it go? <laughs> no, shut up laughing, everyone, and I'll start doing that. <laughs> Honestly, you make me embarrassed. I don't know what I'm doing all. <laughs> I could just imagine Max Wall in a circus ring because everybody would go mad for him. He was so wonderful, you know. But uh, it's, I think it's one of the cleverest things to be a clown. Same as a mime artist. They have no words. They've got to make you visualise and what, where they, what they do. It's wonderful. I, I don't think it's great. I remember him talking to me about Grok, his great hero, the great clown. I remember him doing a wonderful sequence demonstrating how Grok played a violin. <laughs> It was meticulous in its detail and its memory. Grock was a wonderful man because not only his ego, but his soul was in his... He was, he was a funny man in his soul. <laughs> and threw the bow up in the air. Described the circle. Didn't catch it, fell on the deck. He did this three times. If he finished, he couldn't do it, so he went behind the screen and he practiced it. And you could see the bow going up in the air. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you could see the bow going up. It's wonderful. <laughs> Boom. Three or four times and came down again. <laughs> came to the park, so threw the bow up and caught it. <laughs> and he went mad. Ah! Marvillon, oh, c'est fantastique, alors! <laughs> he had quite naturally the face of a clown. It was a, a complex thing to try to paint. It was quite extraordinary to have somebody who had about six different ends to their mouth, having pulled faces his whole life. All you'll see on my face is spaghetti junction. <laughs> <laughs> that always gets a titter. He choreographed his face you know, the movement of his eyebrows and the movement of his mouth, and suddenly being able to put on a mask without wearing one. He didn't have to speak. All he had to do for me was just be on stage and turn and look at the audience and just stop. It was all in the timing. He could hold a pause with an audience longer than nearly any other comic one has seen. But uh, there was a lot of poignancy there, but he would never milk it for sentimentality, like other comics. There would always be a hard edge somewhere. When I was six, I was left an orphan. <laughs> oh, yes. At the age of six, what would I do with an orphan? <laughs> if you want to understand the, the connection between lugubriousness and hilarity and how these things are all one thing with two different sides, he was that, and he could display those two different sides to you in a flash, in a phrase, in a sentence, in a movement. There's never been anybody who could do that and change your mood as he changed his mood so instantly. I can't stand it! I just think so. Did you see that? I lost all control. <laughs> I lost control of myself there. Didn't know what I was doing. I went, I went mad. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my voice is getting high. I'll have to watch that. What was wonderful about him was he made lugubrious and funny. I remember particularly there was one joke where he said, oh, I, I took this uh, uh, woman out. And I said, would you care to have supper with me tonight, darling, at the Savoy Grill? <laughs> Yes. And she looked up at me and gave me a big smile, you know? <laughs> Straight away, I knew it wouldn't cost me anything. And then he'd play for hours and hours, play a bit of music, if we walk around the stage, uh, go over and sort of do a bit more funny dancing, and then say, No teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd sort of, you'd, it'd been so long that you'd forgotten, you'd forgotten that he'd sort of introduced somewhere in that, somewhere about five minutes ago. <laughs> The, 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 um, the feed for the punchline which it was eventually delivered. I'll tell you one thing. I enjoy my act more than anyone. 
It was extraordinary. The lengths he would go to, really, to expose the wheels of comedy going round. And he would say, ah, oh, you've all come to see me, and here I am in the spotlight. And part of you, as a member of the audience, would be saying, oh, don't do this, you know, don't expose yourself so much, because you'll never get it all back. You'll never, you'll never get us back into that easy uh, audience-performer uh, relationship that we thought we were going to be in. <coughs> Excuse me, I must get a room tonight. <laughs> Did you hear that? Well, you must have done your face in this way. <laughs> you notice how quick it was? Quick. Oh, yes, timing, you see. Timing. As soon as I cough, I must get a room tonight, straight away. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. Quick. Not funny, but quick. So, I always remember him on the radio as a kid, and I thought, this is the moment when I've, I've, I've thought back on it. This was the moment when I thought, I'd do it for a living. I'd try and be a comic myself for a living, because it made me laugh, and there were about five of us in the room of the family, and nobody else laughed at this bit, except me. And he did some line, and silence from the audience. He said, well, I don't know. I don't know, so I thought it was a funny line. He said, I mean, I did everything I've learned all over the years. He said, I did everything that's in the comics handbook. He said, I did the tag of the joke. He said, I spread out my arms, I crossed my eyes and everything. Nothing. And it made me laugh as a kid. And all my family looked at me and said, I'm bad. I thought, no, we're all on the same wavelength. <laughs> Excuse me, I must get it. Oh, I've done that one. <laughs> I never tell with them. Oh, I've often told jokes three times. <laughs> yes, they still don't have any effect on the audience. He was sending up comics and sending up the audience and all this stuff. It was... I loved his comments on his own technique. If he... <laughs> well, how about that? How about that, then? Come on, lonely. Is it, eh? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Well, I mean, you know what that was. That was a little hole sticking up. <laughs> God, how desperate can a comedian be? When there was a bit of a lull, he'd walk to the front of the stage and say, I suppose you know I'm making bricks without straw here. <laughs> and, and, of course, it did get a laugh because they suddenly realised that he was satirising the whole business of being a comic, and he did it so well. All off the top of the head here. <laughs> it's an actor's nightmare, the idea of standing on a stage alone with your own material and having to make people laugh. Max just let it hang there. He was like Yorick, the late Yorick, I mean, like Yorick dead. He was sometimes just like a skull hanging there in mid-air. We're not saying much, but you were always a great thinker, weren't you? You can't find a railway carriage anyway these days. Well, you could do that, I can show you. You're smoking now by my courtesy. Oh, dream tobacco, take me away Where there ain't no memories to lead me astray Where I can hear sweet music all the live long day Dream tobacco, take me away Take me away, oh yes Just one more thing <laughs> Wash that sock through for me, would you? Where's the other one? I'm wearing that It was not a very domesticated animal um, I remember saying to him on one occasion when he'd been there for about a week. Look, Max, if you'd like to put your sheets outside your door once a week, I will wash them and you can have a fresh set. And for some obscure reason, he said, well, I can't do that because I haven't any pyjamas. And I've never quite worked out why not having pyjamas meant he couldn't put the sheets out. But apparently this was so. So I said, well, go and get some. And he said, I don't know where to get pyjamas. The pyjama game is the game I'm in and... I'm proud to be in the pajama game, I love it, I can hardly wait to wake and get to work at eight, nothing's quite the same as the pajama game. He made sense of a character who, in a way, doesn't make any sense at all, who's a knife-throwing, alcoholic, uh, jealous, time-and-motion study man. It's kind of rather, rather a difficult little circle to square all that, but he did it. He, you, believed, you believed him. You believed Max. The alarm clock rings. It's 6 a.m. 
And then right there in bed I shave That's what I said While I am still in bed I shave The lava drips and the bed gets wet And oh what a lousy shave I get But think of the time I save Think of the time he saved He wasn't an easy character Because he Well you never know what he, how he was going to be You could say hello to him one day And it was fine And the next day it wouldn't be fine He had a problem with depression he was a man of moods. I remember when we were doing Crap's last tape on tour when Max was in his either late 70s or 80s. Uh, some of the theatres that we were going to insisted that we had a, an understudy. And Max was not happy about being understudy. He thought there was a, a threat waiting in the wings. <laughs> and he, he, he didn't like that. So we had to be very tactful. Oh, but we don't wish to go over those dismal affairs, do we? There were times when he could explode. And, and, and great, the dear Tommy Trinder, who, of course, he was one of Max's friends in the business all through the years. They were both comics of quite different styles, which is probably why they liked each other. They weren't rivals. And Tommy used to say something like, when they were touring together, if there was a full moon, you'd better put Max in chains. Look at you, a miniature man. One minute you're daft, the next minute you're twice as daft. In one particular case, I happened to be praising a performer, not only that I admired, but I thought that if he knew him, he would admire him too. And I happened to mention that this man did not work full-time. He had another business. And then he got really quite upset, uh, and he threatened not to actually do the show. Uh, you are talking about... Uh, someone who is a, an amateur, and there's me. I earn my living doing this. Why should I? And I won't mention the word he used. And uh, he threw his, his hat on the ground, his coat on the ground, there was money, he went, don't you dare pick it up, and so on. Um, and a couple of days later, I received a little note, begged to differ about the person who spoke about, all forgiven, yours, Max. I must have taken leave of my senses. It was a passing thing. That was all it was. Max had his demons, and I think a lot of that can be attributed to... He had, I suppose, the archetypal stage mother, who for many years dominated Max's career. I think that influenced his outlook towards women. I think his mother was certifiably nuts. I'll tell you how nuts. I was engaged to a girl. Stella went to my fiancé and tried to get her to marry Max. Didn't tell Max she was going to do it. That's, that was his mother. I guess he would overreact at times, and you had to understand that. In fact, when you were talking to him, sometimes you'd have to imagine that he wasn't talking to you, he was talking to his mother. Otherwise, you would have taken it very badly. I loved girls. Yeah, it's like a fellow in the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says, well, don't you think of anything else but girls? And the man said, what else is there? <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. But she encouraged me in this. At this very moment, I can think of 12 to 14 women who are tearing their hair out to get to know me. <laughs> Sweet, isn't it? <laughs> but who wants to go out with bald-headed women? There was a lot of hormone flying about, I think, when, when Max Wall was on stage. He had a glamorous assistant in the early 50s. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. And how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And how are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you, and how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and how are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you, and how are you? <laughs> it leaves you one up. She would say, well, what are you going to play for us? And he would say, because you're such a lovely girl, tonight I'm going to play with all my fingers. <laughs> there was something extremely lecherous about that, which he knew. A commercial traveller went to the hotel, checked in, went upstairs, unpacked his bag, cleaned his teeth, got his trousers off, put his pyjamas on, went to bed and read a book. And it was as simple as that. The next room was a honeymoon couple, walls were very thin, and this is what he heard. <laughs> Whose little body is that? <laughs> Whose is that? Whose is that? Whose is that body? <laughs> Tell me whose body that is, Quickly. Anybody? Who's that? 
<laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> he got fed up, didn't he? <laughs> he got out of bed eventually and he banged on the wall. A man says, yes, what do you want? He says, will you get your asses sorted out? I want to go... <laughs> In 1955, when he was at the height of his success in the pyjama game, in the West End, a big hit, a uh, scandal broke. He, uh, he separated from his wife. He left his wife and family. And then, consequently, he met up with a, uh, a beauty queen and, 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 and ran away with her. And the press were full of moral outrage, fake moral outrage. But it was as if he was an evil man, as if he'd done something desperate and awful. And it had a profound effect upon his career. The marriage had gone, completely gone, you know. And I left because if I, if, if I hadn't have left, I would have probably been hung. Mm. Because they had the capital punishment in those days. <laughs> Shut up laughing. <laughs> no, it's true. If, yes. if somebody had to leave, somebody had to break it up, and so it was me. I did so, I regretted it, I had remorse for years. Yes but I was the ogre, and that's all it was. And I, I had left my wife and my children, which really broke me up. And I was in that condition for an awful long time until I met Jennifer, who was the beauty queen, mm. whom I had judged in the semi-final at Morecambe quite a few weeks before and said goodbye to her. Mm. I met her again when I was in pyjama game at the London Coliseum, and a friend of mine brought her in because she wanted to be on the stage and I was opening up an office to discover new talent. Max was unfortunate in some ways that he was around at the wrong time because that scandal wouldn't have caused him any problems even by the time of the even, what, 70s or 80s, certainly not the 90s and 2000, no problems at all. But in the 50s, um, it created a, a, a huge amount of damage and, and a tremendous problems for him and his career. And there was no one there to control it. There was no one there to protect him. So he was thrown to the wolves, and the wolves in this particular case were the media. He didn't have a satisfactory private life at all. And that's very difficult when you're not actually working. You know, that's, you've got to, to try and find, I would have thought, some sort of happiness in the hours when you're not actually you know, you don't rehearse 24 hours a day. That's a lie. Oh, well, lots of go. Plenty of energy, there's nothing like it. At the same time, you have to remember, coincidentally, the variety theatres were, were, were closing. Um, the shape of radio, which had been such a great provider for him, that was changing too. So all those things put together made Maxwell a deeply unfashionable figure. So up north he went and he did the rounds of the clubs. But the extraordinary thing about Maxwell was that, that you couldn't, when you talked to him about this, you could not detect any sense of bitterness in the man at all. He accepted what had happened to him as almost being part of his life. And I suppose that is what comics do. They actually make light of tragedy, and that's what he did in his own personal circumstances. I can't complain about my career. I've had an undulating career. I use that word specifically also to journalists and interview people, interviewers say, what do you think of your career? Blah, blah, blah. You had your bad times and all this. They always ask you that. A bit of woe, woe. They like it, journalists, bless their heart. Oh, it's got to be a bit of woe, woe. God forbid you should be doing well all the time. <laughs> I went to see him in a late night club where he was having to cope with a very tough audience. And at one point they started throwing beer cans. But he was gracious. And, uh... He eventually had to make his exit and said, uh, could you just give me enough applause to reach the curtain with dignity? Which I thought was wonderful, the way he handled them. I shall always remember you here with great affection at the wheel tappers and shunters, and I want you to know <laughs> Never fails, that little one. Does it? Hey, Bernie, doesn't fail. I'll probably finish up just doing that. I mean, he had a hard time in the clubs, but he rather liked it. I'm sure he rather liked it because he liked a challenge, you know, and he liked to be rude, and he liked them to be rude to him. He was so rude to them, you know. But to me, he was much better because he had to work harder for his laughs. Oh, my papa, funny little man, bless his heart, with a long, long nose like Serrano de Bergerac, and right on the tip of his nose, he had a long black hair. 
Every time he sneezed, it cracked like a whip. In the end, he caught a shocking cold and flogged himself to death. Well, when he was in the so-called show business wilderness, which actually he wouldn't have said himself because he loved working in the clubs and loved the people, but he wasn't in the headlines, um, he was also invited to be on some tours with rock groups. One was Mott the Hoople, that was a popular band at the time, and he'd have to be the opening comic. And I had a contract to do 20 minutes, and they started throwing beer cans up and everything, and there's me talking terribly like that from now. And, everything. and I, so I thought, well, this is the other set. And I used their language, which I couldn't possibly use on the beam, and threw the cans back and played football. With <laughs> they couldn't believe it. This Max Ward had never heard of him. And just amazing. To, you know, the roof went up. Laughed and laughed and applauded and applauded. And yeah, his career really took off again. It happens, doesn't it, with lots of performers. You've got to wait until. Um, the climate in society changes, you know, and then if you're still around and you've managed to hang in there long enough, you can use all those wonderful talents and things you learnt in a time before because there's a, a younger generation who've never seen all those funny walks that he used to do that he then became very famous for and all the young people went and said, oh, this is wonderful, I've never seen anybody do all these sort of characters. It was fresh and new. The Royal Court asked Max to play this extraordinary part of uh, Ubu in Ubu Wire by Alfred Jarry with costumes by David Hockney, and Max agreed. It's the first surrealist play, really. King Ubu, this preposterous character that Max was playing, comes forward saying, What, pray, is your name, sire laddie? And the actor would say, um, Michael Fedrovich, sire. And Max loved the phrase Michael Fedrovich, so he'd say, Say it again. And yet he would say, Michael Fedorovich, sire. And Max would go, Michael Fedorovich. And he'd say it repeatedly. I would like to have been called Michael Fedorovich myself. Had I not, of course, been christened Ubu. At which point, that saying Ubu like that, Ubu, would, it would transmit from his face and his speaking into his whole body. And he'd go off whirling around the stage going, ubu, ubu, and danced it, maybe for, maybe for two or three minutes. So you just have to stand and watch that. And in the, you know, if you stood at the back, you can see the audience through this dancing figure. The whole Royal Court audience is rocking with laughter. No laughing, please. Remember, I'm a serious actor. Like a lot of people from Variety, he, he, sees, he saw acting as... Um, legitimate, legit, he called it, and he wasn't. So in a sense, I think people like Max, when they first go into the theatre, they feel like a bit of a fraud. But he proved he could do it, and he could be the funniest thing on the London stage, and indeed was. People forget. I mean, not only was he a master of visual comedy, this guy, a fantastic dancer, he was a tremendous radio performer, because he had a voice that was totally recognisable. He could play instruments, he used to write little tunes. And I always remember one he used to do on Midday Music Hall um, about, uh, I once had a tune, I wrote it myself. I once had a tune, I wrote it myself. On some manuscript paper I found on the shelf. And it was a smashing little song. I finished my tune with a feeling of pride. I played it quite often. Then I left it aside. And he forgot all about this tune. The years went by. And then he said, Then one day I found it, way up on the shelf, just a happy reunion, my little tune and myself. There isn't much to it. It's a simple refrain. But now that I've found it, I'll never lose it again. I'm going now. I thought it was just wonderful, you know. Soppy. Soppy. <laughs> Alice was awfully slender Alice was awfully thin She went into the bathroom She filled the bath and jumped right in She jumped right in Her maid, who was absent-minded Pulled the plug out before she was through Put Johnson, save my soul. There goes Alice down the hole. Alice, where art thou going? Why should I care? Why 
Why should I let it touch me? Why shouldn't I sit down and try to let it pass over me? Why should they stare? Why should I let it get me? One of the things the critics said was that he was too funny. <laughs> Archie Rice was supposed to be an unsuccessful comedian, and Max was very funny in the front cloth acts, which are about half the play. The moment he comes on, people are inclined to think, you know, there's Max Warren, and, and, and he's funny, and anything he does is funny. But I think he's such an inventive, clever actor that I think he's overcome it. The only similarity would be that I knew the Archie Rices. But you see, I was never, at any time, a third-rate performer. Ian, what do you think I've just seen all of you, eh? <laughs> Man with a lemon stuck in his ear. A lemon stuck in his ear, lady. Yes, yeah, straight in his ear, the lemon. <laughs> I walked up to him, I said, what have you got that lemon stuck in your ear for? He said, well, you've heard of the man with the hearing aid? I'm the man with the lemonade. <laughs> Thank you for that burst of heavy breathing. That's the very famous scene that Olivier made such an extraordinary thing of where he says, you know, look at these eyes. I'm dead behind these eyes. And in the case of Olivier, curiously enough, he wasn't dead at all. The eyes were just streaming with pain. But when Max did it, they were dead. I'm dead behind these eyes. <laughs> dead behind these eyes, just like the whole inert, shoddy mess out there. But I don't feel a thing, and neither do they. We're just as dead as each other. The eyes go, don't they? As if they've seen it all. They've seen all those people, those punters sitting out there. They've seen them all before. Tell me something. I want you to tell me something. What would you say about a man of my age marrying a girl of, well, your age? You couldn't do a thing like that. <laughs> You've been away from your old dad too long, haven't you? He'd come out of a wilderness in his own life with um, great pain and embitteredness, and therefore all of this was incorporated into the performance. So it was as if you were an actor in a play with Archie Rice, as opposed to being an actor in a play, with an actor performing Archie Rice. And that was an extraordinary experience. Stupid and cold, my wife. Stupid and cold. That's what my wife is. She's what they call a moron blessing. <clears throat> Don't clap too hard, this is a very old building. After that, Pat McGee, who was a famous interpreter of Beckett, came to me and suggested that Max should um, play Crap in Crap's, Crap's last tape, um, which was an extraordinarily generous thing to do because Beckett had written the part for Pat. And again, it was a revelation. Ah, uh -huh. little rascal. Mm. Box three, spool. Five. Max identified with the man totally. He's an elderly writer, and uh, looking back on his previous experiences, there was also something of the musical comedian. an empathy with Beckett, anything that was Beckett, and yet he would say, I don't understand it, I don't understand it, but he did, he understood it within himself. He belonged to a group of actors who didn't, didn't need to, didn't, didn't want to or need to question why, 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 he just, it just was. If you're acting in a story about the human condition and your human condition, 
your humanity has been conditioned through the years, bit by bit, bit by bit, by the good Lord or whoever says you're going to do this, you do that, and you add it all together and you've got a bit of gaiety and a bit of sadness and a bit of this. In other words, you've seen life. That is the character that should be playing Samuel Beckett. Otherwise, it's no good playing it uh, superficially. None of Samuel Beckett's characters are superficial. How does it fit me? How would I know? No, I mean, uh, how do I look? Hideous. But not more than usual. Neither more nor less. Then I'll keep it. Because mine irked me. Or I have to say, it itched. On the way home, we got to talking about Beckett. And he turned to me before we got out of the car and he said very, very seriously. He said, remember, he said, as Sam would say, all you need in life is a table and a chair. But on the table, there was a radio and a tape recorder. And he told me <laughs> that he amused himself nowadays by turning on the news and then recording himself making comments to the newscaster. <laughs> that doesn't sound like Samuel Beckett, I don't know. Just been listening to that stupid bus that I took myself for 30 years ago. Hard to believe I was ever as bad as that. I'm very well known in the field of classical music. I'm also well known in the field behind the gas well. <laughs> but my visits there get fewer. <laughs> I can only put this down to Anna Domini. Dear old Anna. <laughs> she knocked hell out of me, kid. Whatever they did to Max, you know, whatever happened to his personal life, he still came back and he still made you laugh. Rachmaninoff's prelude. It was an act of extraordinary creativity to have assembled Professor Wolofsky. I mean, just putting together the elements of Professor Wolofsky is a fabulous creative act. It plundered his own subconscious in the most extraordinary way. There was no pretense in a sense that he'd made it up or on the spot. There was no attempt at spontaneity. It was almost stylized, like kabuki or something, all those extraordinary extensions. was a grotesque. He came on and gave a, a completely over-the-top mad performance. It's like watching a zoo creature <laughs> and fascinating. It wasn't just that it was funny, which it was very funny, but it was the feeling that he was doing this on top of a great cliff at the bottom of which was a huge pool of despond, and that if he stopped or allowed himself to think too much about it, 
he would fall into this sea of despair. We used to sit there and talk, and he would drink Guinness, and I asked him after about the third pint of Guinness he had, I said, well, you drink a lot of Guinness, Max, and he said, yes, he said, but I don't eat. And I said, what? And he said, no, I don't eat. He said, I've eight of these a day. Does me fine. I like a few Guinness, 50 cigarettes a day, and a bit of the other when I can get it. <laughs> Actually, what Max needed was endless cups of tea. And the teapot would be red hot until three or four o'clock in the morning. He would retell the entire show that he'd been through that night. And when he'd finished with the entire show, he would go back in history and we'd get Rob Wilson. Oh, no, don't ask me how it all went. I mean, it was a catastrophe. One day he suddenly crossed one leg over the other and I realised with this flash of a foot under the table that he was still wearing his terrible professor's boots. And I said, Max, what are you doing with those on your feet? Not only that, but he'd still got the tights on. And he looked at them and said, well, Celia, I suppose they're part of my feet. What a funny answer. <laughs> there was a misapprehension that he died in poverty. He certainly didn't die in poverty. And, and he was a frugal man. That's a, a term he used himself. When he made quite a lot of money later in life, after having had a bankruptcy, he invested well and saw that it was left to his grandchildren. And he just liked to live in a small flat. He was happy with that. He'd felt fame and had the Rolls Royces and the big houses, so it was going around the same course again for him, but uh, I think he was quite enjoying it, but he was rather amused when he kept seeing the word genius in various reviews. That's what you've come for, to relax. <laughs> to see a genius. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's one of the finest comics that we ever had. And it's a great loss to the profession that he died. But I just hope everybody remembers him, and this programme is bound to bring lovely memories back. Dear, dear, dear. Everything happens to me. If they saw the woman in half, I'd get the top of each. <laughs> he became unique in the end as a kind of compendium of all the worlds he'd been in, which went right back to the 20s and uh, the early music hall, before variety, really, the real music hall. He said, uh, what was that that you said? I said, who said? He said, who said? He said, yes, you. <laughs> he said, I really ought to kill you. I said, kill who? He said, kill you. I said, me? He said, yes, you. I said, but how? He said, you'll see. <laughs> I said, but you'd be hung for murder. He said, who would? I said, you would. He said, me. I said, yes, you. He said, you're right. <laughs> I shall all have to think that over. I said, what? He said, what you said. I said, yes, well, I'll be going. Now, good night. He'd learned the grammar of all of it, of all of entertainment, and he was a complete performer. And you're quite right. I mean, what might he have achieved had he not been in the wilderness for, for as long as he, as, as he was? I mean, he ended up being a national treasure. But he'd been a national treasure for an awful lot longer, I think, had it not been for the quirks of his private life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to do the walking up and down bit for you. Oh, not me! really did cover every sort of entertainment there is. Right to the end. He was totally and completely indestructible. This is me telling you we'll meet again and so until we do I'll say good night, keep well, sleep tight and tell your friends Oh, I'm